Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tammy Wilson from the Sacramento County Office of Education, and I'm the project lead for the California Dyslexia Initiative. We're excited to have so many friends and colleagues from across California and even other locations join us for this learning opportunity. Welcome to our 2022-23 CDI Expert Webinar Series. In this series, we'll learn more about identifying risk factors, setting up effective MTSS RTI school systems to prevent reading difficulties, and delivering research-based instruction to support and remediate struggling learners and students at risk for and with dyslexia. Today, we are really excited to feature Dr. Rebecca Silverman, I have had the honor of serving with Rebecca on several work groups, and I know that you will appreciate her deep knowledge, her expertise, and her commitment to improving outcomes for students. To support our attendees, we've created a Padlet, and that will host the slides as well as a companion document so you can have some discussion prompts and additional resources to further explore the webinar content. The recordings will be posted on our CDI website about a week after the session, sometime sooner. Next slide. The Sacramento County Office of Education is the project lead on the CDI. And a goal of the CDI is to provide professional learning opportunities within the system of support and across California to build knowledge, skill, and capacity around teaching and supporting students at risk for reading struggles including students with dyslexia. We're delighted to partner with our friends at Glean Education to deliver this expert webinar series. And our goal is to build awareness of dyslexia among our state's educational stakeholders. It's my pleasure to turn the mic over to my friend and colleague, Jessica Hammond, founder and CEO of Glean Education. She's leading and coordinating these webinar series or this webinar series. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you so much, Tammy. We are thrilled to partner with SCOE and the California Dyslexia, Dyslexia Initiative to coordinate this webinar series for the second year in a row. For those of you who may not know us, next slide, please. Glean Education partners with schools, districts, and states to deliver online training, school leader consulting, and web-based coaching. Our work aims to build educator understanding of evidence-based literacy and practices and improve student literacy outcomes. Next slide, please. This webinar is the fourth in a series of webinars this year on understanding dyslexia within an MTSS framework. If you haven't registered for them yet, we'll be putting the registration links in the chat so you can be sure not to miss them. Next slide, please. Today, I'm thrilled to welcome Dr. Rebecca Silverman. She's an associate professor of early literacy at the Stanford Graduate School of Education. She began her career in education as an elementary school teacher in her hometown of New Orleans, Louisiana. Passionate about supporting children's literacy development, she has earned her master's and doctoral degrees in language and literacy from the Harvard Graduate School of Education and is now a leading researcher and teacher educator in the field. Dr. Silverman's research focuses on language and literacy development in early childhood and early elementary school. Her work has contributed to the research base on using read alouds, multimedia, cross age peer le learning, and small group dialogic instruction to support the vocabulary development and reading comprehension of diverse learners. Dr. Silverman leads the Language to Literacy Research Lab at Stanford and is engaged in research practice partnerships in the San Francisco Bay Area, including work groups for the California State Board of Education and the UCSF Dyslexia Center. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Rebecca Silverman. Thank you so much, Jessica. I'm excited to be here today. Um, today, I'm going to be talking with the group about supporting diverse learners with reading intervention in an MTSS framework. Um, I know some of you will have attended other sessions hosted by the Sacramento County Office of Education and might have heard some of the themes that I'll be bringing up today. And so for you, I'll just be reinforcing and possibly extending some of the topics related to MTSS that you've already uh, heard or discussed. 
Um, but for those of you who are attending um, a SCOE session for the first time today, I hope to provide you some background on MTSS and offer suggestions for implementation to support diverse learners. Um, I've put it, lots of links embedded in the, um, in the slide deck that I'm using, um, and you can also reach out to me for more information if you'd like to know where any of the information that I'll, that I'll be sharing comes from. So to get us started, um, as you likely already know, um, MTSS it stands for Multi-Tiered Systems of Support. Um, MTSS is a system-wide approach to supporting students that includes screening and progress monitoring to identify students' strengths and needs. The screening is just a fancy jargony word for assessment um, that we typically administer at the beginning of the year that helps us identify students who um, might have a, need a little extra support. Um, and progress monitoring really just refers to additional assessments that we administer throughout the year to determine and check on how children are responding to instruction or intervention. Now, MTSS centers on database decision making, and that's critical um, because what we do is we use those, the data from the screening and progress monitoring assessments to make instructional and intervention decisions. And that's really important um, in the process is to base those decisions off of the data that we receive. Um, at a systems level, MTSS includes academic, behavioral, and social emotional supports for learners. Today, uh, as Tammy suggested, I'll be focusing primarily on the reading uh, domain within the academic uh, domain of MTSS. Um, within MTSS, um, there are uh, lots of different other related words that you've probably heard, and um, sometimes it gets a little confusing. Um, MTSS uh, includes what you might hear as response to instruction or intervention. Um, or RTI squared. Um, and it uh, includes that, but also lots of other supports as well that um, call on uh, administrative support and uh, technical support and, and lots of other levels. But for um, academic supports, we, we think about uh, RTI within MTSS as a way to support, to provide uh, uh, different levels of support to children who might need it. Um, and so here I have um, the, some, some graphics from the California website on MTSS. Um, and I wanted to, to let you know, in case you don't know, um, that the California Department of Education has been working with the Orange County Office of Education to update the California guideline website. Um, and there's lots of great information there if you wanna check that out um, as well. I think it's, it's um, got lots of great uh, visuals and graphics and, and support information. So um, within the uh, MTSS, you have lots of kind of levels of support. You've got the screening data, you're making decisions. Um, some of those decisions are gonna be about the area of reading. And so um, in that area, that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, and why, why do we need those different tiers of support in the area of reading? When we administer screening assessments, what we typically find, um, if we're kind of looking on average across classrooms, um, is that we find that there's about 5% of the population of children that learn to read fairly easily and very little instruction is needed. Uh, this happened in my daughter's class. There was a child that she was friends with who entered kindergarten reading chapter books. It was you know, like, whoa, how did that happen? Um, but, but there are you know, a couple. Um, many students are learning to read um, where it's it's somewhat easy, but they do need some instruction. So they really need to have um, some some information provided to them to kind of kickstart their their uh, learning to read process. For a large number of kids, um, however, and my daughter was among these, um, learning to read is hard, and substantial instruction is needed. And so, you know, for for those children, they're going to need a lot of a lot of support. Um, and then there's this 10 to 15% where learning to read is very difficult and intensive intervention is needed. And those are the children that we might identify as having dyslexia or hyperlexia or some sort of reading disability. So why do so many children struggle? Why is it so hard for over half of the number of kids that we're working with? Um, in part, um, it is because reading is such a complex task. We're receiving information from our eyes, our ears, we're using our uh, articulation in our mouth to try to understand those sounds, we're connecting 
um, meaning or connecting letters and sounds. And our brain is using all of these processes that we weren't actually born to naturally uh, do in order to connect these dots. Um, and so one model that illustrates the complexity of reading and really kind of brings it home um, is a model developed by Hollis Scarborough a number of years ago. This model is loosely based on what you might have heard um, as a simple view of reading, which appears in the purple at the bottom of the screen. Um, and in a simple view, the uh, model suggests that reading comprehension, which is kind of you know, a major goal of reading, um, is that language times decoding, language comprehension times decoding, is that's what we need for reading comprehension. And you can't have just one of those, you need to have both of those in order to, um, so, so the, the multiplication sign is because if you have zero in any one category, you will have no uh, ultimate reading comprehension. Now, Hollis Scarborough kind of blew the simple view up and made it a little less simple um, and kind of broke down some of the main components of uh, language comprehension and word recognition. And so you can see here that language comprehension involves background knowledge, vocabulary, language structures, verbal reasoning, literacy knowledge. Um, and these are the components that um, are involved in what we think of when we think about understanding meaning, either through oral language or eventually the goal is through written language. And then on the other side of this equation, you have word recognition. So word recognition is going to rely on phonological awareness, awareness of the sounds of the language, um, decoding, which is uh, awareness of how the letters or symbols in a language map up to the sounds, and then sight recognition, being able to do that quickly and uh, automatically so that you can uh, eventually become fluent with those skills and be able to then um, spend most of your cognitive energy on, um, on being able to extract meaning and um, learn from text. Um, now, <laughs> a lot of people say, you know, I said it's complex. This model is already complex. Um, so there's lots of other things that I want to acknowledge that are also involved in reading. So we've got cultural and linguistic background. We've got prosody. We've got motivation and engagement. We've got attention. We've got executive functioning. We've got uh, the, the differences between different texts and activities um, that are related to the context. Where am I learning in school or at home or in after school? Um, so there's lots of other things that are related. I'm not going to dig into those things today, but I want to acknowledge that um, when we're talking about instruction and intervention, um, to the extent that we can hold all of this information, um, we do want to think about how all of these other components might play into differentiating within an MTSS model. So uh, when I started teaching, um, I was taught that first children learn to read and then they read to learn. And the message that I got from this was that teachers in the early elementary grades should focus on learning to read by focusing on word recognition and decoding skills. And then teachers in the upper elementary grades should focus on reading to learn or comprehension of text in order to learn new things. I was a second grade teacher and I was a second grade teacher with lots of children reading below grade level. I knew I needed to work on decoding, but I also knew that if I didn't work on comprehension, when they got to third grade, they wouldn't be able to comprehend the text that they were expected to be able to comprehend. So I felt really, I felt this tension and the struggle with that model. And many of you might've learned that about that um, kind of learning to read, reading to learn um, approach uh, yourselves in school. Um, what I think is a better representation of how this all works is the one on the right. Um, and this is based on a model that uh, was developed by the Hill for Literacy, um, which really shows that language comprehension is developing from day one, maybe even before day one. Um, and children are learning words, they're learning meaning, they're developing background knowledge, they're learning about the structure of language. Um, and that's something that not only are they learning uh, through their environment, but can benefit from instruction and for children that are having difficulty can benefit from intervention. Um, along the pathway for uh, word recognition, you have phonological awareness, letter sound knowledge, et cetera. That follows a much more staircase-like approach where you're building on uh, smaller units of sound, uh, letters to, to letter combinations, 
um, and you're getting increasingly complex as you, as you uh, advance in this field of reading. Language comprehension, to some extent, we can, we can create a scope and sequence, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But in general, even very young kids are sometimes learning sophisticated words, and we are, as adults, still learning words ourselves, many of which uh, are entering the language for the first time. You know, I, I learn words from my teenager all the time that are entering the language. Um, and so vocabulary, for example, is a lifelong process. And so we want to be paying attention to both of those things and really holding them both in mind. Um, so optimally, in the you know, best case scenario, if we look at uh, that top bar of reading as, let's say, grade three, um, children will have advanced in these decoding-related skills, and they will have advanced in these language comprehension skills to a point where they are um, able to meet each other in the middle, so to speak. You're able to read fluently, you're able to access text, um, and you're able to understand what those words that you uh, decoded mean, how they work together, what larger message uh, a text is giving you. And so I have uh, kind of thought about this is rather than learning to read, to reading to learn, thinking about that all along children are learning how to read to learn. That's all of these things are in process. Um, the whole time. So when we think about those kids, um, the large number of whom might have difficulties um, learning to read, there might be different profiles. And our screening data can suggest what, uh, what kind of buckets um, kids might fall into. Um, so we have, uh, in this graphic, um, we have uh, the below level readers, uh, that we might think about as the, the children who might need inten uh, in intervention. Um, and these are children who could have difficulties in either word recognition or language comprehension or both. And it's really important to try to understand what the struggles of children are so that we can tailor our instruction uh, to meet the children's needs. Um, and so the arrows show that this is really a continuum that, you know, you might be a little bit struggling in one area and a little bit advanced in another area. There's kids all along this that we can think of as um, needing different levels of support. Um, but in general, we can think about that there are a few categories to which we can respond when we think about how to um, design our uh, instruction and intervention. Now, I put these other um, things, and I'm sure you guys can think of other ones that, that should be there um, on the right that we also might want to consider. I think, you know, at the primary core, reading is going to involve uh, word recognition and language comprehension, but these other things are going to be coming into play. And we might want to think about how to differentiate our instruction and intervention in order to support things like differential levels of motivation and engagement or different levels of attention. Um, so th those things are there. I'm not focusing on them today, but, but I wanna keep them there because they're important. So what are the implications for instruction? If there are different profiles of readers with different strengths and needs, what does this mean for how we um, as educators respond? Um, it means that depending on the kinds of readers, there might be different constellations of instruction needed to support development. Um, and this is based on the work by Carol Connor, um, who proposed thinking about providing uh, code-focused instruction for children with decoding or word recognition difficulties and meaning-focused instruction for children with language-focused difficulties, um, and then providing both for children who have both of those difficulties. Um, and in Carol's work, um, she based this on the amount of time one spends on different categories of instruction. So, if a child has a, a lot of need in the area of code-focused instruction, maybe 80% of the time you'll be focused on that instruction, but you still need to have 20% uh, of the time focused on meaning, or it might be flipped, 80% of the time focused on meaning and 20% on code-focused. So there might be different, um, uh, different amounts of code-focused or meaning-focused instruction depending on children's different profiles. Um, but these are two variables on which you can kind of think about how you might uh, differentiate. Um, and then also, uh, just to, to note that in Carol Connor's work, the research that she conducted on using a model where she had screening data that kind of provided profiles of children based on this code-focused and meaning-focused instruction um, and professional development to support teachers 
in delivering these different amounts of instruction, um, she found that that approach was much more effective um, uh, on uh, reading outcomes than using the approach that, that is typically used in schools that um, don't have kind of this highly differentiated uh, framework. And so, you know, we, we've got some research-based evidence that doing this kind of differentiation can make a difference. So earlier I mentioned response to intervention and I talked about increasing levels of support for students who need it. Um, now I'm gonna talk through how to map code-focused and meaning-focused instruction onto these instructional tiers. So at tier one, all children um, should be getting uh, both code-focused and meaning-focused instruction. And that's really important um, for us to recognize is that all children will benefit from having both of those things attended to. Within tier one, and this, uh, this is one thing I wanna really emphasize, within tier one, we also should be providing some differentiated instruction for children based on their reading profiles. So based on whether we should be giving a little bit more emphasis to word recognition or language comprehension um, and using the data to make those decisions is really key. How do we group students? How do we target student uh, instruction for the students in that group? How do we differentiate for, um, for the learners across our classroom? Um, using the data to make those decisions is really critical. Um, I emphasized the differentiated instruction at tier one because sometimes teachers that I've worked with think that, oh, the small group instruction is tier two. Actually, we want everyone to have small group instruction that's differentiated for their reading profiles. Um, the children who are struggling and are showing that they need more support based on that progress monitoring data that we're collecting, um, those children need additional instruction, supplemental, on top of their tier one instruction. Um, and this instruction should be um, in smaller groups uh, with focus on up to three components of literacy as needed, um, again, using that data. So we'll use that data to group students to figure out um, our lesson plans to meet the needs of those students. Um, all of those things are really critical for tier two. And then for children who are not responding to tier two, so our progress monitoring data is showing that they're still struggling. We're gonna need some really intensive individualized intervention. Um, and th this uh, should be in addition to their tier one uh, instruction and sometimes in addition to their two tier two, depending on the model used in the schools. So at tier two, how does that look different from tier one? What's the difference? Um, since we're talking mostly about how children move from tier one to tier two, um, you can think about that in a tier one setting, you've got some whole group instruction uh, where children are provided, you know, a few children at a time are provided opportunities to, to say, an, you know, uh, get, provide a contribution um, to, to have some practice. Um, we're gonna try our best to get kids involved in that whole group activity. We're also going to have our small group time to have some more focus, uh, focused attention for them. But when we move up to tier two, we're going to really start to intensify. So what do I mean by intensify? We're going to increase the learning time. So we've got tier one plus tier two. They're getting more minutes um, of whatever that, that uh, range of skills that we need to focus on is. We're going to reduce our group size. So maybe in our tier one, we have a group of five. In tier two, maybe we have a group of three. So we're gonna, you know, so that children have more focus, more attention uh, from the teacher. Um, and then we're also gonna provide more opportunities for practice and feedback. So, you know, children who um, are getting that additional support also need lots of chances to try it out, um, to get feedback from their teacher, to, to um, have that focused attention on what they're doing in the moment. Um, and so that really is how we're going to intensify. And then, of course, at the individual level, that intensification is going to be directed um, squarely at the individual needs of the kids. Um, so I've talked about reading profiles and kinds of instruction, um, code-focused or meaning-focused required to support these profiles. I want to talk a little bit about what do we know from the research literature um, about these different domains. Um, and so... What we know about interventions for decoding um, is fairly well developed. There's a fairly good consensus in the field about the things that we should be focusing on to promote decoding and word recognition. 
Um, so this is, uh, in this slide, I present uh, some recommendations from the Institute of Education Sciences at the federal level. Um, they've commissioned some reports that synthesize the research liter literature about various topics. Um, and these recommendations are um, adapt from a guide on foundational literacy skills for K-3. And these are the recommendations that are focused on instructing and intervening for decoding. So what do we know? Um, I'm, I'm sure you've heard this and are aware of this, but we know that we need to attend to phon phonemic awareness. This is the individual letters of sound, uh, the individual sounds in a word. Um, we want to develop that awareness so that kids can uh, move to connecting those sounds to letters. That's really important. We know that we want to focus on phonics. We want to have uh, support children in moving from uh, connecting sounds and letters to moving uh, to, to multisyllabic words, um, more advanced spelling patterns, so that children are able to read more uh, increasingly more complex uh, patterns of words. And then we also want to be able to develop, uh, give children the opportunity to develop um, their automaticity so that they can do this uh, reading of words, decoding of words accurately, and also um, their, auto, their automaticity so that they can do this quick enough so that they're not, uh, their cognitive energy is not being uh, siphoned away from being able to make meaning. So, so this is really critical. And for the most part, I, I don't think many research researchers would argue about this. This is, um, you know, kind of, we know this is what we need to do. In the upper um, elementary grades, we also want to focus on decoding. And I want to stress that because sometimes when we think back to that uh, learning to read, reading to learn model, we forget that kids are still learning to decode even in the upper elementary grades. And so I want to highlight, this comes from an IES practice guide um, on interventions uh, for students in grades four through nine. I mainly focused on kind of four or five or, or into the early middle school years. Um, but the IES recommendations are similar. We, we still want to be focusing on those decoding skills, um, particularly for kids who are, are struggling in those areas still. Um, and so we want to think about, um, there's not as much of an emphasis on phonemic awareness at this point because kids have been introduced to letters and letter patterns. Um, but we do want to think about how can we build students decoding skills so they can read those multisyllabic words and how can we provide purposeful fluency building activities to help students read effortlessly. So we don't want to drop decoding after grade three. That's uh, many children still need support in that area. We also know that there's general consensus on how to teach these skills. Um, so you've heard about structured literacy probably. Um, and essentially what that means is that we want to provide systematic and explicit instruction. Systematic instruction just suggests that there's a planned sequence of how we're going to go from easier skills to harder skills. Um, and because decoding is uh, so well um, kind of uh, uh, sequenced, we can do that. We can make sure that we're building on, uh, on earlier skills before we introduce more difficult skills. And then explicit really means that we're clearly explaining these skills. Um, we might provide some explanation some modeling with really well-chosen examples. Um, they're not, children aren't expected to just intuit these on their own. We're, we're giving them information. And that can really, for a lot of kids, help, um, help prevent frustration because some kids just get so frustrated with not, not being able to figure out these rules that uh, we bring in things like motivation and engagement and those start to suffer. And if you're not motivated or engaged, you're likely not to want to read, and then you're not going to get better. Um, so these are we have we have a fairly good idea. This is you know most programs that we would suggest using to support decoding are going to have this structured literacy approach. Unfortunately, in conversations about liter structured literacy (RTI) and MTSS, language comprehension has received less attention. Now it's there. I mean, it kind of says and language comprehension or and uh, comprehension skills. Um, but I think it's important to elevate those somewhat to make sure that we're all thinking about those as well. Um, and, and in fact, uh, to be honest, a lot more research is needed so that we can uh, understand how to better intervene for language comprehension. Um, because there, there is a lack of, uh, there, there is not sufficient research. I should, there, there is research for sure, and that, that's what I'll be talking with you about today. But we need more of it. Um, so, you know, what... 
what, why, uh, why do you think less is known? You know, what, why is uh, language comprehension been a harder nut to crack, so to speak? Um, so when we think about language comprehension or this other side of the equation, um, a major difference between decoding skills and language comprehension skills is that decoding skills are fairly constrained. So what this means is that there's a small number of elements that we need to learn. Um, there are specific uh, kind of in influences. The assessments are more precise. Um, it, it, there's a, a narrower scope of things that we need to learn in that domain. Um, so for example, in English, we know there's 26 letters that map onto 44 sounds. Um, and we can define a scope and sequence based on what we know about which of those letters and sound mappings are easier or harder uh, for children to acquire, and we can teach them in that order. Now, because of the irregularities in English, decoding is more complex than in other languages, but the task is still relatively well-defined. Uh, like I said earlier, when you compare that to language comprehension, language comprehension is much uh, less constrained, or we consider an unconstrained skill. It's conceptually unbound. Um, we're, we're learning about vocabulary and comprehension throughout our lifetimes. Um, and the sequence of skills is a lot uh, less well-defined. You know, you might think about easier words or harder words. You might think about easier syntactical patterns or harder syntactical patterns. But I'm sure you've all experienced, you'll have a a uh, for kindergarten or first grader come out with these giant words all of a sudden, you're like, where did they get that from? Um, or you'll have uh, uh, kindergartners or first graders who don't know a more basic word that we sort of expected that they would know. And so what, um, based on, on their other vocabulary. So in, in terms of why it's, it's been harder to, um, a harder nut to crack, it's because it's, it's actually a more complex skill and it's relying on lots of different, um, processes that we're bringing together. Um, and this particularly when we get to reading comprehension, we're bringing to bear the decoding aspect and all that that has um, onto this language comprehension component um, and trying to put them all together. So students are having to navigate and coordinate lots of different skills. And sometimes it's in the coordination that things start to break down. Um, so in order to understand this kind of challenge of reading comprehension, uh, language comprehension interventions. Um, I worked with a couple of my students a couple of years ago. Um, this was our sort of pandemic project. Um, we, to conduct a meta-analysis where we reviewed the research literature on interventions targeting language comprehension to find out um, how effective they were and what we can learn from that. Um, and so uh, I've got the links if you wanna check them out yourself. Um, but essentially we found a number of different things. First, um, effective interventions tended to provide explicit instruction and practice in language skills and comprehension strategies. So those pieces from decoding um, in structured, liter in structured literacy uh, kind of pull over into language comprehension. We do want to be very clear with children about the definitions of words or the functioning of uh, morphological word parts or the, the way that sentences work syntactically. Um, because that information can help them unlock things that are going to be just really tricky to figure out on their own. Um, so if we can give them that explicit instruction, give them some of that information, um, it can really ease, uh, ease the burden for them. Um, similarly, um, we want to do lots of practice. So, you know, when we're thinking about um, comprehending, we want to we give kids lots of opportunities to do that with feedback. So the teachers uh, engaging with the children to, to um, help the children, scaffold the children's uh, language comprehension as they go. Um, second, uh, effective interventions tended to focus on more than one component of language. And so this is interesting because sometimes you'll see interventions that are just focused on vocabulary. But what we found is that the interventions that focused on vocabulary, morphology, um, maybe even comprehension strategies in addition, those tended to be more effective because of how multidimensional language comprehension is. Being able to focus on lots of different parts of it um, is really critical to being able to advance language comprehension. Um, third, uh, the interventions, the effective interventions tended to include 
Um, read alouds. So for kids who are not at the at the level of being able to read texts on their own and or even are um, just not, they're able to comprehend at a level much higher than their, uh, their so-called reading level, um, read alouds are hugely valuable because children, um, you're taking the burden of decoding away, so to speak, and you're letting them focus on the comprehension piece. Now we're, we're going to put those things back together, right? We, if, we, if we can only uh, comprehend through oral language, then, then you're missing out on the part of being able to make meaning from text. So we'll put them back together, but for the purpose of developing language comprehension and intervening on it, um, read alouds can be very powerful. Um, also providing supports for decoding when possible, either through uh, text-to-speech uh, applications or um, using multimodal texts, like for example, eBooks. Um, these can help students access content above their decoding level and really focus on that comprehension. So that by the time they've uncracked that decoding piece, they're able to really understand uh, sophisticated and advanced text. Um, and finally, effective interventions focused on text structure and different types of texts. And this was important because, you know, if we spent all of our time doing um, narrative, we wouldn't be able to comprehend lots of different texts. And, and um, as you may know, in the past, we often in the earlier grades focused mainly on a, a diet of narrative uh, read alouds or, or narrative uh, literature. And what we found is that then when kids got into the upper grades and were, um, were expected to, to be using text a lot more for different content areas, they didn't have as much uh, ability to comprehend. And it, it, some of the strategies from um, different, from fiction to nonfiction, for example, transfer, but some of them are, um, are different. And so it's important to be able to, for children to have uh, opportunities to practice in different kinds of text structures. Um, and again, back to the explicit part, uh, we as adults know that texts often work in certain ways and we can use that information, that text structure to help us comprehend, help us remember, help us pay attention. Um, but if we don't provide that information explicitly, we're, we're asking kids to figure that out on their own when we could provide them some of that explicit intervention through say graphic organizers, um, through some modeling, uh, it can be connected to writing um, on text structure so that they can use text structure to comprehend. What else did we learn? So um, as we talked about earlier, uh, you know, thinking about the K2 versus 3-5, what are the differences there? Um, what we found is essentially that interventions for language comprehension um, were, they had similar effects across K2 and 3-5, suggesting that um, intervening early can be very helpful, but sometimes children don't actually present with comprehension difficulties until later, when text becomes a little bit more advanced, they're um, trying to use text to, uh, to learn new concepts that they haven't had as much exposure to. And so we call those late, uh, late emerging reading difficulties. And so those children might need uh, instruction and intervention um, that's more explicit, more intensified, more systematic um, in grade three to five as well. And so what we found is interventions that target the earlier grades are as effective and as important as ones that um, target the, the grades three through five. And um, what we learned is that intervention in grades K2 were often more, um, more often implemented through read alouds, whereas in grade three, five, students were more often reading independently or with support for decoding through, say, text-to-speech. Um, which might not be a surprise, but is important to remember as we think about different interventions. Um, and interventions in K2 and 3-5, they focused on the same skills you're using similar methods, but the complexity of, say, the vocabulary, the syntax, and uh, the strategies were, were, was greater or higher in grades 3 through 5. Um, we also found uh, that interventions focused on language comprehension often have greater effects for multilingual learners. Uh, than for non-multilingual learners. Um, and this is really important because when we think about those things that children might differ on, um, certainly language background is one of those places. Um, and so when we dug into those interventions that showed effectiveness for multilingual learners, what we found was that those interventions tended to leverage the strengths of multilingual learners. So multilingual learners are often more uh, highly attuned to using cognates across languages. These are words that sound similar and spelled similar across languages. 
They're often also more attuned to how language works because they've had to figure some of that out themselves. Um, so leveraging those strengths can be really powerful. Additionally, these um, interventions provided specific scaffolds for multilingual learners. For example, they might provide translation um, or comparing and contrasting across languages um, to help multilingual learners um, as they're trying to navigate uh, more than one language at the same time. Um, that maps on well to the IES Educators Practice Guide on Teaching Academic Content and Literacy to English Learners in Elementary and Middle School. And you can see that um, the recommendations there uh, map on well. You're teaching academic vocabulary. Um, you're integrating oral and written language. You're providing regular structured opportunities to develop those language skills. And you're providing small group instruction to, struggling, uh, to students struggling in the areas of literacy and English language development. And so this is coming into uh, the, tier, the tier one and tier two space. We wanna provide a differentiated instruction for all and tier two instruction for children who need it. Oops. Um, so here's where uh, some of my work uh, comes in. Um, I have worked on a project, uh, it's called Clavius, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, um, but it is an example of a kind of intervention that has shown to be effective uh, for multilingual learners. Um, and here, uh, this research showed uh, the effect of a small group intervention focused on supporting grade four and five multilingual learners. So those kids at um, the upper elementary school level um, that showed its significant effects on standardized measures of English language and reading comprehension. And the, uh, pulling the strategies or principles out from that, that curriculum, what we found is that really focusing on that metalinguistic awareness, trying to reflect and manipulate language, that's important. Um, engage in dialogic approaches, so give students lots of opportunities to talk back and forth and use that language. Um, use multimodality, so have, uh, have students practice comprehending across print and video and using different modalities uh, for supporting student sense making. And then finally, really leveraging that multilingualism rather than telling kids to put, you know, leave that at the schoolhouse door for, for uh, lack of a better way to say it, um, we want them to bring that in and use what they can do uh, to foster their literacy development. Um, so I wanted to just end by giving you two examples of programs shown to be effective. Um, so this is an, uh, an example in K-3. This program is called Let's Know. It came from uh, research done with a Federal Reading for Understanding grant. Um, it, it's called from a, a, a consortium called LARC, the Language and Reading comprehension uh, consortium, I believe. Um, and the, the features of this program um, that I just wanna point out is that in K2 or K3 rather, uh, they used read alouds. Um, they focused on content areas. So you can see they, the read alouds at the top. Um, they provided explicit information about words like the word mineral and the word soil. Um, they provided uh, uh, support for uh, translation or multi for multilingual learners. Um, you can see at the top. Uh, for Spanish. Um, they also focused on comprehension strategies in the early grades. And so sometimes in the past, we found that teachers thought they, did, they didn't need to focus as much on comprehension strategies until later. But this, this project really focused on those strategies uh, from, from the beginning. And so they uh, attend to inferencing uh, and you know, a really scaffolded and structured way to do that, as well as uh, text structure like cause and effect. And then here's an example from our program, the Clavis program. Um, Clavis stands for Cultivating Linguistic Awareness for Voice and Equity in Schools. And we similarly use uh, content-rich text or text related to content area themes. Um, we have, we do, uh, because many children have decoding and language comprehension difficulties, we sometimes read it ourselves. We sometimes have the kids read it. Um, it depends on what the, the children uh, that we work with need in order to be able to really focus on the language comprehension piece. Again, um, we do um, explicit instruction of vocabulary. Uh, we put that in context. We give them examples. We ask them questions to really have them consider critically and think about how words are used. We focus on um, word parts, for example, prefixes and suffixes. We think about um, uh, syntax and how things like pronominal reference are important to understanding text. Um, we provide translations and uh, you can see we have an audio button there. So even for teachers who don't speak the languages of their students, we can 
they can use that to help kids, help activate kids uh, crossing cross linguistic awareness. Um, we have them think about ways, what, what the children know already that they can bring to the table. And then finally, we have them discuss all of these ideas so that they're really using the language that they've learned um, in order to talk about uh, comprehending text. So putting that back into the context of uh, RTI or reading uh, instruction and intervention, um, I wanna just uh, highlight that we wanna be thinking about both code focused and meaning focused instruction at all tier levels. Um, and that this should really be based on the data that we're getting uh, to understand uh, the constellation of skills that we need to support children with along the way. Um, so my major conclusion is yes, there's been a lot of focus on phonics lately and absolutely we need that. My second graders, when I was working uh, as a teacher who could not read, they needed the, the phonics instruction and I needed to figure out how to support them in that area. But we also need to be focused on language comprehension, particularly for multilingual learners, but for all learners, because we're, they're gonna need that in order to comprehend the text that we want them to know. Uh, so that's my big message. Yes, and for intervention, um, I hope that helps uh, give you some background on how language comprehension might come into play um, within MTSS and how to use MTSS for diverse learners. So thank you for, uh, for listening. Thank you so much, Rebecca. That was a wonderful presentation and chock full of really important material. So thank you for sharing that with us. We actually do have a few minutes for questions. So we'll begin that in a moment. But before we start that, I just wanted to mention a few things. Uh, including our companion document, which accompanies each webinar. So this companion webinar companion document includes prompts to discuss after attending the webinar and additional resources to further explore the webinar content. You can find the documents and recordings at scoey.net slash CA dyslexia. So the next slide is the last slide that I'll have you show before we head. Oh, we'll do we'll do this and then the survey. So in terms of this, we have a, a PLN that's going to be coming up in March, I believe, and that uh, is something that you can sign up for. The links will be in the chat. Don't miss them; they're amazing. And the keynote speaker is Dr. Tracy Whedon. Um, so the next slide will show you our, our webinar survey, which is really important for you guys to fill out so we know how everything went for you. And the link is going to be in the chat shortly. And then we can begin our questions to Dr. Silverman. So the qu first question we have is, what assessments would you recommend for comprehension? Mm, that's a great question. Um, I think... I think from a research perspective, there needs to be a lot more work on that. Um, but many of the screeners um, that are available um, have a comprehension um, domain. Um, so first, we want to see that the screener has some attention to vocabulary. That's really important. Um, ideally, other language skills as well. So for example, um, syntactical awareness, um, uh, being able to comprehend uh, it, listening comprehension, um, you know, being able to comprehend a sentence, for example, or, or a whole paragraph by listening to it. Um, it and so you want to look for screeners and progress monitoring tools that have those domains represented. Uh, some do, but not all of them. Um, typically, how we, um, how we assess those skills is uh, for vocabulary, we often have uh, a, a screener that uh, measures words that we think are are highly representative of words in general, word knowledge in general. And so we, you know, for example, give kids uh, four pictures and they pick the picture that matches the word, um, or they have a, a, you know, have to do a yes, no response to whether uh, a word makes sense in a sentence. Um, for comprehension or listening comprehension, sometimes we have kids um, listen to a passage and answer questions about it, or they might um, listen to a passage and have to think about what word is missing from the passage in order, you know, they're using their meaning making skills in order to figure out what word is missing. So you really want to look for um, assessments that have those things represented uh, when you're choosing um, uh, your screening measures and your progress monitoring measures. Okay, great. Thank you. 
Um, another question is, do you have suggestions for strategies and programs that are helpful for students who are able to decode but still need work with fluency? Sure. So um, what we what we want to do with uh, children who have fluency specific um, needs is we want to give them lots of practice with texts uh, at increasingly difficult levels. So we might want to start at lower levels of text and have them practice until they can get automaticity um, and accuracy with those texts. And then we want to build up. Um, we also want to do things like supporting them in understanding this is actually connected. So, so there is connection across, right, the decoding and the language comprehension. We want to um, uh, help them understand things like how do, do different syntactical patterns um, suggest how a sentence should be read. Um, and so when uh, we might do things like, um, you know, so you might hear about scooping uh, parts of a sentence, you know, where we're, we're scooping different phrases that we, we want to um, get more fluent with, uh, those kinds of things. So we can also give them some strategies to think about how to get uh, faster. So I would say it's going to be practice with uh, decoding words uh, more quickly, more accurately, um, doing that within context, out of context and in context. Um, and then uh, thinking about other strategies that can be used to support fluency development. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, I have a question about the research base behind small group instruction in tier one. Can you talk more to that? Sure, so um, what we know is that uh, if we're using the same curriculum for everyone, um, we're likely to not get as positive, as, as uh, high of effects as if we're have an intervention that has um, differentiation included at tier one. And so we've shown that, um, that when you compare a curriculum that has only one pathway to a curriculum that has a couple of pathways that teachers can be using for differentiation. So for example, support for how to group students, uh, support mm -hmm. for how to um, address student needs within those small groups, um, those uh, uh, curricula tend to be more effective. Now, I, I wanna be clear that sometimes uh, folks, when we when we used to think or thought about small group instruction, you know, we would change the level of the book, but our instruction would be pretty much the same. That's not what we're talking about here. The instruction might actually look a little bit different. It might uh, be a, a different amount of focus on different skills. Um, it might be different levels of support uh, for different kids. So thinking about differentiation, not just changing the level of book, but also and what skills to address uh, for kids with different needs. That's really helpful. Thank you. What curricula would you recommend that has both, you know, kind of robust uh, word recognition pieces as well as these language comprehension and vocabulary pieces that are so critical? So I'm, I, I don't work for any publishers, so I, I'm not going to get involved in, in naming specific uh, curricula or, or, or specific interventions, but I would, I would say that for um, teachers, administrators, uh, you know, district level folks, um, just really critically analyzing curricula um, as you're choosing them to make sure that they have tier one uh, supports for teachers um, that include decoding and language comprehension across grades K-5, um, making sure that they have uh, support for intervening on those skills across for K-5, so either a supplemental intervention or um, you know, other books and materials to, put, to help teachers uh, deliver um, some uh, tier two intervention to the kids who need it, and that that intervention is differentiated. So sometimes we see you know, a program has an intervention, but that intervention looks pretty much the same for everybody. We wanna see that the, the tier two or supplemental supports that uh, are provided within the curriculum are also differentiated. Um, and we wanna make sure that the assessments that either we're you know, deciding on our alone or that come with the curriculum um, have some attention to both decoding and language comprehension. So, because, you know, that'll help teachers pay attention to those things um, as well. Okay, great. And you had mentioned that people tend to think that structured literacy is more about word decoding, but um, is it accurate to say that that's not, that's not the case? In fact, if it's delivered well, it has this robust kind of vocabulary and comprehension component in addition to the, that word decoding as well. Yeah. Can you speak to that just a little bit? Absolutely. I think that's kind of where um, people have associated structured literacy with just the decoding realm. 
Um, and yes, absolutely. That's that's you know very much where we want to we want to talk about being explicit and systematic with decoding, but we want to bring some of those same concepts over to language comprehension. So we want to teach vocabulary words explicitly. Um, mm -hmm. To the extent that we can, we want to sequence the difficulty of the syntactic skills, you know, from, for example, from, you know, nouns and verbs to more complex phrases, uh, we can sequence those and we want to teach them in the order um, that will help kids uh, you know, be able to acquire them. Um, and so, yes, structural literacy should uh, include all of these additional domains and we should be intervening for kids who need additional support in all of these different domains. And I think that's where sometimes uh, there's been a misconception uh, that mm -hmm. structural literacy just includes decoding. Yeah, and I think something really interesting you were talking about is the multi-component interventions, including morphology, vocabulary, and comprehension. And that seems like an interesting layer as well. Um, so another question that came up in the chat uh, is about bilingual support. Um, so I'm going to read that one. I'm trying to get information regarding the recommendation and recommended setting for students in a bilingual class who are struggling with decoding. Should these students be moved to an English only class? Mm. So, no, I, I don't think that they need to be moved. I think um, a lot about, you know, the decision to be in a bilingual uh, instructional uh, context is uh, very dependent on the child and the family and what's best for for them. Um, I think that uh, you can deliver tier two intervention focused on decoding across languages within a bilingual context. And so um, we don't we don't wanna just move kids because um, they need support decoding. We wanna provide support for decoding where they are. And in fact, leveraging uh, decoding in their home language to support um, mm -hmm. decoding in their second language can sometimes be helpful. Okay, great. Um, one last question that we have time for is when you're teaching, in general, kind of tier one, how do you kind of, uh, how would you suggest structuring time and delivering tier two supports? Yeah, time, time is always, um, that's the biggest question we get from teachers when we implement uh, interventions. Um, typically, and I'm sure many teachers uh, on the webinar today use this approach, um, we have the uh, a sort of stations or centers approach where um, students are working with their teacher for some of the time. Um, and then moving to different stations uh, that are providing additional practice, no new instruction, but additional practice on other skills that they've learned. Um, and we're also, um, we're also providing uh, uh, additional supports when needed. So sometimes in schools, we'll have um, a, another staff person come in and help support the teacher, um, a volunteer. If you have parent volunteers, this is a great time to bring one of them in to help manage the classroom uh, while children are going through stations. So, you know, kind of being creative with the resources that you have. Um, at tier two, often um, I've seen schools uh, that have certain blocks where kids go to like a, half the kids go to a special and then the other half is an intervention, either with a teacher or with another interventionist, like being really creative with schedules. We've got these really like calcified notions about how schedules should work. It's, it's mind blowing when you see schools that do this really well because they've got, you know, kids going in all different directions and meeting with different teachers, but it can be done. So I think just thinking creatively about how time is used and how we can get that additional instruction for kids who need it is really critical. Thank you. That is so helpful and instructive. And I think that's about all we have time for today. So thank you, Dr. Silverman, for all that information. We want to thank you on behalf of Glean Education, the Sacramento County Office of Education, and the California Dyslexia Initiative. And thank you to our wonderful attendees who come here and spend the afternoon with us after a long day at work. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Our next webinar is with Dr. Lillian Duran on language comprehension and a structured literacy approach. And that is the perfect jumping off point from where you left us, Dr. Silverman. So thank you so much for that. Um, that will be on February 9th, 2023. So please register for that event. The link should be in the chat. And we really are grateful for spending time with you today. Thank you, everyone.